if you could tell that story without it trying to make certain people villains and certain people heroes, it's a very informative and important story. And the reason it's an informative and important story is it gets repeated over and over and over again in the software industry. It's a big story, and it really, at the end of the day, buried down in it, uh, is a lot to inform people if the story was told properly. But it turns into a personality story very easily. Uh, Tom believes that he was screwed, and there's a certain validity to why he believes that. Mm -hmm. He's not completely wrong. Then the, and, and the thing is that he got screwed, and then his reaction to having had that happen like compounded things dramatically. I had been working for another company and that moved out of state and I was unemployed for a while and decided that they needed somebody um, to keep them organized and then when I started working for SCA, they had been in business for about a year, just Tom and Andy. And when I started working for them, my brother handed me the, the files, the company files. It was a large cardboard box with every piece of paper they had dealt with in the last year was just dumped in this box. You could say they were in chronological order because the newest stuff was on top. But that was pretty much how we started when we were working at home. My computer was, desk was next to my bed. And when the phone rang in the morning, I rolled out of bed and started work. And if the phone rang at 8 o'clock in the morning, I started work at 8 o'clock. And if it didn't ring till 10 o'clock, I didn't start work till 10 o'clock. <laughs> my partner and I were in software consulting at the time, doing a lot of programming. Um, our customer base had taken us into PCs and PC programming from the mainframes. And, uh, you know, we write programs. We were spitting our programs left and right, and we figured we were going to try selling a few of them. And one of the and we had customer support, we had other reasons, and we decided, well, let's try setting up a bulletin board, see if that'll help out at all, or besides it looked interesting. We started researching FidoNet and how to make this thing work, and never looked back. That was, that was it. But at that point, we had a reason to do it and a mission in life, and we've just been pushing that ever since. I mean, he generated a tremendous amount of technology, and more than technology, concepts. Conceptually, he took steps that this was a thing to attack, this was the next problem to solve, that this was proof that it could be solved. I really liked him. He did. He contributed a lot to FinalNet. He contributed a lot early on, uh, and he took some of those. He took in many ways, more of those steps than very many single people did. He contributed a lot of stuff he contributed. Ah, he worked his butt off on finer news. He was a genuine contributor. You know, he started out as a seaman. That was what he was. He was like one of the guys who goes on to the freighters and goes around the world. And, and uh, he's a total genius, absolute genius, photographic memory, amazing person, and with some of the greatest stories. And, Without him, FedNet wouldn't have grown the way it did because the mailer could be on all the time rather than just at 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, without him, there really wasn't going to be echo mail, which is what got all of BBSs to really hit some critical mass. Absolutely. He did a lot of things when nobody else would do them. Uh, and he did them extraordinarily well, and he got reamed for it every time because uh, not a lot of people understood his sense of humor. Um, and he had a nasty penchant for uh, poking holes in, in, in uh, 
people's stories. If they would come he did not and, suffer fools gladly. No. no. If you said something that was stupid uh, and hadn't been well thought out, uh, then Tom was right up there to say, gee, that was stupid. You didn't think that out very well. <laughs> right in your face. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was a big advocate for Tom for a long time and tried to, you know, tried to really take his side and a lot of stuff for quite some time in those early days of Fidonet, but it just became difficult at a certain point because his idea of how he should respond didn't feel like something that to me was going to get him there. We always got along even though there was a point where we prepared we didn't want to be in this, literally in the same room because it was just tense. But, uh, Yes, he is a complicated guy, and he's done, he's done a lot of good stuff, and I think he really means, I don't think he ever meant badly for anybody. In the market I was dealing in, you wouldn't buy a program that didn't come with source code. You'd figure the guy who wrote it was trying to pull something over on you. You know, I mean, in the mainframe environment, it worked that way. He started out with things being free. You right. was, he was trying to use the model of get it out there for free and then start charging for it at a time when that model was pretty unique. And, uh, and it turned a lot of people off and turned a lot of people against him. And then, and by the way, many years later, entire companies were built on that model, like Netscape and others. I called him up one day and I said, do you take uh, something electronics? I don't know. It's a professional uh, publication. And he said, no. I said, well, you advertise in it. And he says, yeah. I says, well, directly opposite your ad is an ad for PK Arc. Quote, the other Arc program, close quote. Yeah. <laughs> Dead silence on the other end. And finally he said, say that again. And I read it back to him again. So he went out and got a copy of the magazine and looked it up. And oh, he was mad. I followed uh, as best I could without getting my feet wet um, the life and times of Mr. Katz because uh, I'm the one that recommended to Tom and Irene that they go to court. Um, and so I felt uh, in, in many ways a bit responsible for that outcome. At the time, I was just following accepted practices. This is how to make a living doing this stuff. 
Well, the certainly. Office, what you do, you publish it, you declare copyright, somebody infringes you, you send a cease and desist letter. Suing wasn't our first choice. We sent a cease, you know, we, and there were other people who were, who were doing the same sorts of things under license. Vern Bird, who had a, a, an archive extractor that was faster than, than PKX Arc and smaller. You know, we were working with them. There were people doing versions of ARC on several different operating systems, and we were all working together. We were working up what we called it the ARC Consortium to, to deal with all this. Uh, Phil Katz pretty much told us to get lost. said uh, his was a completely original work. It had absolutely nothing to do with anything that we had ever done. It was just he and his mom came up with it sitting around the kitchen table. No resemblance. All purely coincidental. Of course, you know, our expert witness got a hold of his source code. It turns out to have my comments in it. So, yeah. Fundamentally, when you looked at the code, it was exact, including the spelling errors. Um, because my brother wrote some of that code, too, and he can't spell to save his life. Um, I mean, the spelling errors were exactly the same. You know, there was no doubt in our minds whatsoever. We knew we were right. I remember that Tom spelled his name with an H. I remember S E stood for System Enhancement Associates. I remember thinking they were just a bunch of, let beep this out, they were a bunch of dicks. And, you know, picking on this little guy who was trying to make something better. So what? He called it this. Fine, he changed the name to something else, they still wouldn't let him go. And of course, everybody was behind Phil Katz at that time because he was the little guy. And um, SCA was the big, big brother corporation that nobody wanted to deal with. But it was, it was just, it was like a David and Goliath thing is how it struck me. And all the systems were out there. Everybody was pushing to uh, not purchase C's software and stand behind uh, Phil Katz. And, and we all switched. We all just kind of ran over to him. It never occurred to me that there might have been something going on there, and I'm still not sure that there was. Tom was not always the big guy. He was a small guy at one point, and I think he forgot where he came from and just decided that, you know, he wanted to be king of the world. Little did he know that Bill Gates was going to be king of the world. There was no big company involved anywhere. Yeah, it was Tom and Irene, and they had one guy working for him. One guy working for him, and it was uh, Phil and his mom and a guy working for them. And I think Katz fed on that, and he, he fed that he was the underdog. You know, and there was two family businesses that were vying, and man, he took his code. That's not, that wasn't right. And, and um, even if you went to make, which is okay, you're supposed to be able to take some stuff and you make your enhancements and that's it. But yeah, you got to give your credit. And if you took all the exact code and you just stuck it in, and he didn't even remove it the comments. So it's like, he didn't even take the precautions a normal good thief should take. I still, I'll still never understand, okay, why, you know, I mean, we weren't, and, and anybody who wanted to look could see that we were not a big company. You know, it was a small family. I, said, I think the most we ever had at one time were six full-time employees and one part-time. And it was just this massive organized PR campaign. We were, Annie and I were, we were techies. You know, we were software consultants out of Manhattan, whether we know. You know, and we got blindsided by this thing and just... Buried us, and uh, you know, with, and I, I ended up hating to read the mail. And I don't know how that ever. A lot of it being a small company, okay, and trying to sell to the corporate world, you want to try to you know look like a bigger company than you really are. 
but that's not an easy thing to do. The thing is that that's the classic case. Phil was able, Phil understood that it was a PR war and was able to wage it well. Tom thought it was a war of, and this is, this is, this is an engineer's failing, thought it was a war of unemotional facts and that when all the facts were on the table, everybody would see them, not realizing that as soon as something turns into a PR war, nobody is ever going to see the facts anyway. It wasn't that we thought it. It wasn't that we speculated it. We were right. Um, and we just could not believe. And that starts to sound like I'm saying he's a bad guy when I think quite the opposite. I thought Tom was a good guy. I did a lot of work with him. I licensed his stuff. I, I, mean, I, I interacted with him a lot. And I think he's a good guy, but he, he, he made the kind of business failure versus technical failure in analyzing how to deal with problems in front of him. I still can't believe it. I still can't believe it. Oh, a whole lot of it that, you know, the stuff that went on, it's like, you know, we were right. Yeah, mostly, I mean, because that, that's the easy you thing. Hmm? You really want to know is he can have a cut. I used to say, sure, I wasn't about the money, it was about the mail. There wasn't that much money involved. And most of that would come from corporate licenses, like somebody would send us, shoot, you can probably still see, I think it's still at the price list online, it wasn't much. Um, you know, corporation pay you know, for like an unlimited license or something. Once in a blue moon, you get one of these things in. That oh, okay, you know, some big office buildings, you know, whatever. And, and that was where where the bulk of the money came from. I mean, we get every now and then. I think it was and it was actually a cheap. Uh, uh, I don't remember how it was. Uh, I don't remember how much the the, the licenses were. But the unlimited uh, license was was a reasonable chunk of change. Uh, and and Every now and then, every you know, once a month, every other month, the company would would buy one of these, and you know, however often, and that was that was where the bulk of the money came from. Uh, but but the bulk of the payments were individual thirty-five dollar payments from people, just plain old people, and they'd write letters. I got fan mail. I used to love to, to go to the post office with Irene and pick the mail and she'd drive back and I'd go through the letters and open them and read them. And then he started a hate mail campaign. People would write me letters to tell me how much they hated me. People who didn't know anything about me, who never met me and never would. a guy calling on the phone and he asked me some questions about it. And we talked for a while and I explained the whole side. I explained legal ramifications. I explained copyright law. I explained social ramifications. I explained you know, artist ownership of works and plagiarism and all the rest and it all finally boiled down to it. It didn't matter. He didn't care about right or wrong. He, he, he didn't 
care about right and wrong. Yeah, you know, because when, when we finally made the move and they saw the SEA and, and, you know, made the decision to move on, he was done with it all. You know, and I think at that point in time, he probably would have been happy if he never saw another computer again as long as he lived. And He has, a, I suppose, a right to a certain bitterness that he's not seen as the one who brought those technologies to bear in each case when he did. Okay. At the same time... You know, it's it's how he handled it at a business level, not a technological level, and not a personal level. It's a business level interaction that he had business opportunities that he took incorrect steps to try to handle, and as a result, other people benefited at a business level much more than he did. But you know, the side of it too is it's it was just one program, and I've written a lot of programs over the years, and. And looking back at this point, it's a minor utility for an operating system nobody uses anymore who really cares. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.